Good morning, everyone. My name is Giselle Fernandez, and uh, I have my own interview show on Los Angeles Magazine Online. And we interview titans of industry about themes very much like we're going to be talking about today. Lots of themes about access to capital, um, leveling the playing field for all America, access to jobs, etc. And one of my most recent <coughs> interviews, please check it out, shameless plug, was with Michael Milken. Um, so I guess uh, I didn't do too badly because I'm here moderating and very honored to do so. Um, we are here to talk about the skills job uh, crisis in America, the skills gap crisis in America, um, which basically means um, colleges and industry are either not training or churning out workers, students, with the proficient skills to enter the workforce. And it's a big problem, and I'd kind of like to lay the groundwork before I introduce our panelists. Um, today, we have more than 75 million Americans who are not prepared to perform middle skill work. What kind of jobs are we talking about? Manufacturing. Um, right now, we have 500,000 jobs open in manufacturing. The industry needs welders, pipe fitters, electricians, engineers, people skilled in robotics and basic engineering. Can't find them, can't hire them. Trucking. At a time over the last, at any time over the last several years, there have been 30,000 uh, too few truckers to run long haul routes. Energy. Bloomberg reports that Gulf Coast oil, gas, and chemical companies will have to find 36,000 new workers, qualified workers, by 2016. This is not happening. Computer coders, analysts, people in the healthcare industry, logistics, operations, at a time when the country needs massive infrastructure. We don't have skilled workers to be able to pump that new fuel into the economy. Um, we have, again, 18 million people who are either unemployed or underemployed, a million jobs to be filled, and what we have is a skills mismatch. Um, what kinds of people are we talking about who are in this pipeline? We're talking about the underserved, single mothers. We're talking about people of color in underserved communities and a large preponderance of Latinos because of the dem demographic surge in our population. What happens when these kinds of folks can't find a pathway to their own future and own income? We see Baltimore this morning burning in the headlines. Um, these jobs will account for 45% of new job openings over the next decade, but only 25% of the 2012 workforce supply um, have the, had those mid-level skills. So this does not bode well, and this is uh, probably an alarming crisis. You wonder why it's not more in the headlines, and I think we should get into that. We have a, a, an esteemed panel representing all sectors of um, this issue. And I'll start with um, Felix Ortiz III. He's the chairman and CEO of Veritas Learning, an online powerhouse that uses data and algorithms to match student skills to the right employment opportunities, creating a viable pathway to jobs and careers. Veritas offers scholarships and training online. And Felix says part of his mission is to redefine the middle class. We have Eloy Ortiz Oakley. He is the superintendent and president of Long Beach City College. Um, he's renowned throughout California for his innovative policies um, and programs that help students succeed in colleges. And he strongly believes that California's emerging economies demand a workforce with certificates and with degrees, and that community colleges play a pivotal role in moving this state forward. Then we have Chris Romer. President and co-founder of Quad Learning, uh, part of American Honors, which creates affordable pathways for students to earn bachelor's degrees. He has a two-year program designed to help uh, high-ability kids finish their degrees at top-tier universities. Chris is a former Colorado State Senator and knows well what policy leaders should be doing to help close the get jobs gap. And then we have Raul Valentin. He is the Vice President of Talent Acquisition at Comcast and knows all too well the challenges of trying to find um, qualified workers to enter the workforce. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being here today. Felix, I'm going to start with you to kind of set the stage of how alarming this crisis is. You have said that this job gap crisis is um, a national security threat comparable to what's happening in the Middle East and in North Africa. Why don't you lay that out for us? Uh, yeah, sure. So about a month ago, we were in Dubai with uh, President Clinton. Uh, and there, the skills gap individuals go into ISIS. Uh, here in America, they go into gangs or, unfortunately, into poverty. Uh, and so if we can improve the skills gap and get these people employed, we would reduce crime and other poverty issues that exist today in America. 
And Eloy, when we look at this underserved population, especially now the surge of Latinos, do you think there is a reticence um, to invest more in this population, and that's why we're seeing some of the issues we're seeing? Well, I, I think there's just a, a, a misunderstanding of where we need to be and, and how important this generation is to our future. Um, I think now more than ever, um, a high school diploma is not enough. Uh, a post-secondary credential is a ticket to the middle class, the kinds of skills that students need today, which will allow them to change jobs 10, 12, 14 times in their career, unlike previous generations. We need to come to a better understanding of what America needs, and I think the President laid it out pretty clearly in the America's College Promise proposal. The default should now be a post-secondary credential, and that's, that's what um, these uh, individuals need, and that's what California needs in order to continue to prosper. Chris, you've worked with high school students. You've yep. worked in uh, colleges with a preponderance of underserved kids. You know, why are they having difficulty navigating the system? Well, I mean, first and foremost, this is just a, a national. I mean, the social contract in this country is about social mobility. And in 2008, that social mobility pipeline really fell apart. And I think employers were initially happy because they had lots of applicants and life was easy. The problem is that contract that we have in America that people can and move to the middle class has fundamentally been changed because it's now defined by skills. And what we know in this country is we are not going to redistribute income through the tax system. That is not going to happen. We have to redistribute opportunity through the education system. That both parties can agree to. So it's, and it's a big issue, and I think Felix is dead right on this. This is not a small ball issue. This is about the, it's about social, it's basically about the social contract in this country. And what I know from my experience doing this for 30 years in charter schools, another thing is, the students who are really the future employees of all these companies now sit in low-income high schools, in community colleges. They have the hardest path to that credential, and they have the least college knowledge in that family, and we're not doing a very good job of getting them to the college knowledge to execute to get that certificate. But that's why opportunities like what Felix is doing, what we're doing, is really providing those students the clarity of how to navigate that system. Because with all due respect, and I love what uh, Eloy does, it's just much harder to start at Eli's College and then go to Berkeley than to start at Berkeley as a freshman. It's just a harder path. Now, I can argue very well that it's a better path for lots of different reasons, small class sizes, more welcoming to Latino students. But at the same time, it is a, the students in America who have the least college knowledge have the hardest path to getting that employment certificate. Mm -hmm. And before we even get into what colleges should be doing and what industry should be doing, I just kind of want to set the stage here. Raul, do you think this is a, 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 a something that industry is investing in? They understand they have to invest in these underserved communities to get a workforce? Yeah, I think it's been said well. I mean, I think and it's changed a lot from 2008 and went from the employers having kind of maybe the upper hand. Um, and there is a gap as we look for jobs across it. And it's really from entry-level jobs, whether it's in sales, um, our call centers, technicians, um, all that lead internally into promotion opportunities, into management, and continued upward mobility um, economically for those folks. So I think it's important. You see a number of employers like Comcast reinvesting in things like mentorship programs, internships, cooperatives, trying to work and find the right partnerships actually with schools and stuff to figure out how do we expose students. We're working um, some programs in Philadelphia where we're headquartered with high school students, right? Trying to get them earlier and trying to expose them because it's not just kind of the technical skill, it's the soft skills. How do you work in an office? How do you work on a team? There's, there's really a number of skills that we really need to support them with. So, you know, one of the big problems or challenges is uplifting a community that doesn't know how to navigate or doesn't easily navigate um, the college system anyway and the school system. We make up 25% of the college population and graduate less than 12% into the workforce. So that's right there a big challenge that could be a panel in and of itself. But then when we get in, when we get our kids into schools, um, we also have a low graduation rate, even though the admit rate is way up. Felix. Um, why aren't our community colleges um, preparing our students for a relevant workforce? Why aren't they being hired with the skills they need to be? Um, yeah, so if all community colleges were like Eloy, they, they would be. <laughs> it's going to be uh, a very civil panel. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, I mean, I, I think that at the end of the day, it's really the lack of connection between employers and community colleges. Uh, you know, employers have a specific pathway that they lay out and community colleges are still trying to catch up to that pathway. 
uh, and the inability for these people to be talking to one another uh, in local communities, it's a big challenge. Uh, and oftentimes, there's, that's what leads to a mismatch. But you also say there's tremendous bureaucracy. So with fast-changing technologies, universities and colleges can't keep up with the curriculum, and it takes too long to actually change a curriculum. So what do you suggest has to happen? So uh, I, I would say that you know, a state center like Chris uh, should change the uh, policy uh, that exists within uh, community colleges. I think it has to be down to the trustees uh, and allowing the presidents to have more power uh, to really change uh, the implementation of new curriculum. Uh, because then they fall about 36 months to 60 months behind implementation. So, Ely, you've also said in a number of narratives that, yes, the community colleges need to do a better job. You've been maverick with your programs, but first let's talk about just the whole dynamic and infrastructure of the college system. What are the main challenges to get these kids educated in a way that really prepares them for their workforce? Well, first of all, I think we, we need to take a step back and and look at what's actually happening. Um, you know, we take this approach that we need to fix these kids. We need to, when it's the system that needs to be fixed, it's both the employers and the school systems because at the end of the day, we can complain about public education all day long, but this is the gateway to the majority of students of color. No matter how you cut it up, you can build as many charters as you want, you're not gonna get the scale you need. So we need to figure out how employers are gonna work with public education systems and states to figure out how to improve the funnel uh, to ensure that we create the workforce that we need. And we're not talking about a stratified workforce. I mean, we're, we're not, we shouldn't be talking about relegating these students to uh, some sort of caste system where we're only talking about workforce jobs and we just prepare them, we train them to be some employer's um, uh, workforce. This is about giving them tools to be able to navigate the workforce to continue to build upon their education and give them the kind of opportunity that we all have because we all have our degrees. Uh, we want to give them the same opportunity. So, you know, employers need to stay and work in states. They need to quit trying to figure out how to get around tax revenue systems and they need to invest in, in states and local communities. Likewise, community colleges need to listen to those employers and figure out how we're going to change our system to better adapt to the kinds of things that everybody here is talking about, the changes that are coming, the changes that are already here. What do you think about the notion that America is too fixated on making sure that all you know, kids have access to that four-year degree when that diploma is not translating into a real you know, job that puts food on their table? Should we return to more vocational training as we used to in this country? I, I don't think it's an either-or situation. Um, uh, when we're talking about having some sort of post-secondary credential, what I'm talking about is not everybody pursuing a four-year degree. Now, we shouldn't prevent students from achieving that goal if that's what they want. <laughs> but we've got to create these intermediate credentials that allow them to keep moving forward in the workforce. And then if they choose to, can continue to build on them toward a degree, which we all want them to have if they want to anyway. Um, so, so it's not an either-or situation. Uh, students coming out of high school should be college and career ready, both, it's not either or, and our colleges should continue to work with our K-12 system to allow them to navigate those pathways into careers and then out of careers back into school and back and forth. What can state and local governments do to make sure that policy changes and that curriculum is more relevant to the industry? I, I think two things. One, they, they need to tie funding to outcomes. Like if you give people a business model that says I'll pay you no matter, and I may just use a crass term, putting asses in classes. So if that's the way it works, then I'll basically put asses in classes. That model is not working in America. It's not working in the K-12 system, it's not working in the higher ed system, and yet that's exactly how we fund it. Now slowly but surely policymakers, like when I was there in the state senate of Colorado, are moving to a performance where we actually pay for a degree and an outcome, a certificate, because it immediately changes the way you think. That's a big, big issue. That said, you got to be very careful because a lot of the great work that Eloy does can be unwound if all of a sudden he's only paid for outcomes. He's very quickly not going to take the most challenging students in his system. So we have to change the, we have to ch do both carrot and stick to make sure you really deliver this. And back to Felix's and Raul's point, you need to make sure that this, the industry is at the table. And the, there's a history, and I'm sure that Eloy runs a great dental hygiene program, because the, the job needs for dental hygienists have changed a little bit, but not that much. The problem is, in coding, 
we have a whole new world, and Eloy needs to be relevant in the coding world. And the answer is it's not. <coughs> Lastly, this issue on advice. Well, this is really there's more content out there. There's more online content. ASU is providing content to everybody, including Starbucks now. It's not the content, it's the advice. These families have low college knowledge. They have low ability to understand the middle class playbook. You've got to train them in the middle class playbook. That's honestly what we do in our honors programs. We take smart kids and we just literally give them the middle class playbooks that our children get at our dinner table. Well, well, what is Comcast specifically doing to engage with colleges like Eloy's? What are you doing to create training programs and outreach to our community to make sure these kids make it through college and into your offices? Yeah. Well, I, I touch on it, but I want to go back just on the comment sure. because I think it's interesting on the outcomes, right? Because yeah, I, won't, I won't say it the way you said it, but we would say, you know, especially in recruiting, it's butts and seats, right? You want to fill the jobs so you can get that product launch, you can get the service provided. Um, that's the outcome, right? So it's not even about them being in classes, right? It's about can they get a job that's really going to move them forward beyond the certification. A lot of people have certifications. That doesn't mean they're successful. And I think a theme I'm hearing is this notion, how can we partner, build a common framework or a language around lifelong learning? Because those are the people that tend to do well, regardless of what their title is in an organization. They're increasing their skills. And that trying to find how do we do that with education, right, with employers, with everything working together in a common language. I think that's the struggle um, that's there. In terms of programs that we've done, we've, we've kind of built a very robust campus program over the last couple of years, coming out of 2008 where many employees really went away from campuses. They felt they didn't need to hire um, students as much in the numbers that they did, um, and that was you know in the press and all that stuff. A lot of stuff around co-ops. I think we continue to see the opportunity, as we've talked about, how do you provide that pathway? Then working with programs like Work Ready, um, 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 some other programs that really target high school kids, and again, because I can't stress enough, it's about um, and, and I know I grew up in a, you know, in a family where it was just my mother and she worked a very hourly job and the notion of how to shake someone's hand, how to put on a tie was not something I grew up with. So how do you expose kids to that kind of environment um, is really, really important. So those are some of the programs that we're doing. Internet Essentials is another thing we're doing to kind of just close the digital divide. We're touching over you know, a million families already in terms of providing low cost internet access and broadband access because so many of those same students don't have that in the home and they're disadvantaged in terms of preparing for school work and having access to information. Um, so that's another thing we do. But are companies like Comcast actually engaging with colleges to help formulate curriculum so that we make sure that the skills that are being taught are relevant to regional economies? Yeah, I think increasingly so. There's um, a number of initiatives that are trying to do it. It's just getting to the table, and it's it's the speed, I think, is what we talked about. I think it's, we, you know, whether we like it or not, most public companies, you know, live quarter to quarter, right? So you're looking for that launch. You know, we sit there and say we want a new product launch every quarter. The technology changes. We No one knew the, the areas that we were going to need to support the mobile technology platform that everyone is run, running right. to five years ago. No one was thinking about that. Today, that's in short demand. But what we're not looking at, both as employers and I think educate, what are the basic skills that allow us to then teach and train that, right? We, so that's the employer's responsibility as well, is understanding how do we help those folks and say they've got the right core skills. And again, those core skills are both technical and soft skills to really excel. Well, compounding the problem, too, it seems like the entry-level job has gone away. Companies are looking now for specific skills in middle uh, management that these kids don't have, and are companies willing to train and apprentice? Yeah. So, so it's a supply-demand thing. So I, th I think the good news is companies are starting to. Coming out of 2008, most companies felt, no, I can be very specific. I can ask for this type of skill, this type of person with this kind of credentials from this kind of school. Um, that has shifted, and I think that makes, you know, that's the, the mother uh, innovation, right, is like need. So all of a sudden, um, I think you're seeing increasingly employers saying, what are those core skills? How do we train that? Um, offshoring was a huge phenomenon. Not that people don't do it, but it's used very differently today. Um, I think companies are also waking up and saying, for me to build future leaders, they need to start here more so, right? So we keep saying about this, every two years someone changes. Well, that was self-imposed both by the company as well as the, the employees. So how do we change that dynamic? And part of that is you hire people and you let them grow. We think about most of our jobs, um, the manager or the supervisor roles really, 75% of them are filled internally from entry level positions because they know the work better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Felix, you said, look, employers just need to dive in and play part of this game in a more aggressive way. You know, can you kind of share what you're seeing from your end and why you developed the company kind of algorithm and data to link skills to jobs? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's also a bigger issue. You have these trade associations in Washington uh, that are typically built by academics and 
you know, do not bring the employer to the table. Uh, and they fight between their own, uh, within themselves. And so, for example, you have one association, they have five different credentialing bodies, uh, and the employers don't recognize that credential. Uh, and so how do you standardize that? Uh, the other issue is you have 18 career competency models, uh, all of which are thousands of jobs within that model, uh, and then you have to break that into micro pathways uh, so that the student understands how they accelerate within that pathway. Uh, and so I think it's really, again, reverse engineering from the employer side while bringing in the uh, colleges to the table. Uh, I was just at a co community college conference. I didn't see one employer in the employment uh, panel. Uh, to me, that was baffling. Uh, you know, you have the workforce dean there and the you know, head of workforce for a vice chancellor, uh, and they talk about the strategies of how they want to bring in the chamber. But the chambers are uh, just typical CEOs that are running a nonprofit. Uh, so there's no business at the table. Um, and the same goes for the BRT, the Business Roundtable. Uh, they try to do a good job with the workforce uh, co-chairs with Tillerson and, and, and Spiegel. Uh, but at, at the same time, they're not bringing the employers. Uh, so they have to come together and formulate this employment triangle. And I think data analytics uh, helps uh, provide the proper foundation for a student who may not know what they want to become, have the right pathway to employment, and eventually get matched to the job. And to, as the funding changes post-employment data, allowing the institution to retrieve that data. Because right now they have no way of capturing that data. They don't know where you know, Felix is employed. They don't know if he ended up in the right pathway to the degree or the credential, uh, so that data doesn't exist today. But it exists through various levels. Uh, yeah, through us it does, yes, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> is it up to then the private sector to create this new bridge to employment development? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a hybrid approach. You, you have to work with both the employer and the education provider. You know, our, our goal we, you know, is not to uh, make the community college obsolete. Uh, we believe that they're the central nervous system of the community along with the library. In some cases, they're the ones that drive these communities. Uh, so we want to become that uh, partner from the pre-enrollment phase all the way through post and allow them to become better based on outcomes and, and data so that they know what the trends are in the employment market localized to their community. Ela, you take this all in, and you've been maverick in outreaching to, you know, to businesses and regional economies, and also, you know, Goldman Sachs with your 10,000 Jobs program. You've really created partnerships. But what more needs to happen to really create a solution here? If you had a, if you had control of the whole system, <laughs> and you have access to the governor, he's appointed you to various things. What would you? What would be your first big change to move the needle here? Well, I mean, um, part of this is uh, we, we keep playing at the margins around all of these discussions and all these system changes. And, you know, I, I'm just going to focus on California. Um, we have a system that has evolved here over time that has created some very stubborn silos, both in terms of the public education system and in terms of how employers interact with each other and with the public systems and with the policymakers. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we, we need to get to the root of the issue. Um, we need employers to be present in the state and commit to providing the revenue the state needs to create the workforce it expects. I mean, we're very lucky in California. Over two and a half million students attend our community colleges, primarily students of color, first generation students. So we have the mechanism in place, but we have to find ways to change public policy and to have the support we need from from labor, from, uh, from employers to make those changes happen. At the same time, we need employers to stay put and to really engage in the tough work that needs to happen to change these policies. Because they're not going to happen in a vacuum. Just because it's the right thing to do doesn't mean it's going to happen. So you look at a company like Starbucks. Are they moving in the right direction? You know, I think Starbucks just felt that it needed to make something happen for its own employees and did something. So I think, sure, that's the right direction. But at the end of the day, we can't have one-off solutions to a major problem. We've got to invest in the major solution and do the work necessary to get there. But you also said we have to hold companies accountable who yes. profit off our you know, constituency but don't reinvest like an Apple, you said. Well, yes, and I'm carrying my uh, Apple gadgets everywhere I go. And, but, you know, and I understand from, from that point of view, uh, maximizing revenue, but, but at, what, at, at what price to the, to the workforce that you're, you're relying on. Uh, so there's got to be a more clear conversation about what everybody's role is and what they need, 
what kind of skin in this game everyone needs to, to put in? The president has, you know, um, is pushing his free community colleges for two years. Is that one of the answers to create a, a more fluid pipeline? To me? Um, I would not have that be the only. Access is enormously important. These families are, in many cases, uh, literally a paycheck away from being out of work and unable to get to the hospital, and certainly un unable to get to school. So cost is a big deal. But when you look at the data, it's not cost what's holding back this process. In my opinion, just look at the data, and I'll call it out. Go look at the new study that was just done by SUNY. It's a problem called ASAP, where they doubled the community college graduation rate, and they did it fairly effectively, but it's not cheap. And it includes the following criteria. Full time, the students go full time. Secondly, they get to put in cohorts, so they absolutely have a culture of learning community of high expectation. Intensive advising, by the way, these are exactly the same things we do in American Honors for honor students. This is a formula that works, but I know if Eloy went and said to the legislature, I need the funding to do ASAP, which means I need my students to go full time, not to have 80% of them work, I need my students to be able to be put in cohorts of 100. I need a really well thought out advisor for each 100 students, not one advisor for 1,000 students. Okay? Let's be clear about that because there is, this is where policymakers, and Eli is dead right on this, policymakers and employers are trying to play this on the cheap. It's not cheap to build good employees. And these are things that work. I mean, ASAP, the Merkel Foundation said this is the singular most effective intervention in community college they've ever seen. And yet, it was a shocking statement 30 days ago, and you've heard nada from policymakers about saying, this isn't complicated, it's just not cheap. Well, let, let me add to that. Uh, in, in defense of the president's proposal, I, I, I think we get lost in the rhetoric of this notion of free, and certainly I, 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 I don't recommend just talking about this as free. I, I think the, the issue is, you know, there was a time in America where high school was not free where we just assume, you know, high school, a high school diploma was something that you, you could strive for, but as a public policy point of view, it wasn't something that we expected everybody to have. At some point along the line, we changed our opinion about that. We all felt as Americans that a high school diploma is mandatory. We need it for the workforce, and we made it compulsory. I think the issue here is a post-secondary credential is now replacing that high school diploma. And we need to ensure that all of our students have access to that. And I, I agree with Chris, free isn't just the answer. But to have the expectation as a public, as a society, and as students that a post-secondary credential is a must. And to change that expectation, I think that's the key. And that's where we need to get to. But Felix, you don't, you're not in favor of a free two-year um, program. Why? You know, I, I just think that they have to have some skin in the game. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a former paratrooper, uh, and I look at my buddies who use the GI Bill to go through college, and some of them still dropped out, and that's free tuition. Uh, and I think that the notion of having something for free uh, creates the wrong, wrong <coughs> excuse me, interpretation of what these folks should be doing, uh, and having that skin in the game will motivate them even greater to complete their task. The governor of California has made a maverick and controversial move to um, cut costs to all three um, university systems in this state, and he's promoted a um, $50 million line item um, innovation reward um, because he wants to increase um, graduation rates and the time it takes to get degrees, and he wants to see some investment, return on his investments. Eli, what do you think of the governor's um, innovation reward? Well, having just received the top award, I, I think it was a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> but uh, seriously, congratulations! Dollars, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you. But seriously, um, uh, I, I think it's the right move in California. Uh, it's not a role that um, the uh, state government has typically taken, or the Department of Finance has taken. But I think. The notion that we are going to reward, we're going to create a prize and a competition for public systems to try and innovate, to try and reach these goals, I think is a good thing. I think we see that in private industry, when we set a goal, when we create um, a necessity, you know, people will try to find a way to meet that goal. I mean, it, it's sort of like the old saying, if, if, 
If somebody knows that they can catch the bus, they're going to run. We need to make our public systems run after that goal. And I think creating that carrot, I think, has, has got us down the line. Now, I think it's got to be followed up with continued investment, continued carrots and sticks, as Chris mentioned earlier, so that uh, these um, public systems continue to innovate toward the kinds of outcomes that we want. Giselle, I'm going to sure, push back please. a little here because <laughs> no. I, I'm telling you people, <laughs> it, it's wonderful. I could but steal the why, heat. Why, <laughs> why do you have to incentivize a system to change at the speed of the economy? Like, what is wrong with the system that it's not doing it of its own accord? Why do you have to put a carrot of 50 million out there? And I'll return to my basic formula. They're incentivizing the wrong things. You have to change the fundamental formula very thoughtfully. Go look at the Gates Foundation study of this. You have to start paying for outcomes, not inputs. And employers should insist on this in every state, but be very careful what you wish for and how you do it. Most importantly, there is rigidity in the California system. You all built, and, and I was a graduate of this state as well, this state had the best JC system going to higher ed. It had the world's class best system. It has been underinvested in by this state for the last 20 years. And the state is, the state is gonna pay it because you cannot simply have sunshine be your economic development strategy, <laughs> right? So you've got to rethink this issue. And so, yes, I'm really pleased you got that award. But then the question is, why did you need the damn award in the first place? Why isn't the institution doing what it should do in a beautiful state is solving itself? And the reason is there's a bunch, and I won't break it down because some of it's really sensitive, but there is rigidity in this system. There's rigidity in your statutes. Go compare your higher ed statutes to any other. Let's be honest. Go take your higher ed statutes and compare them to Texas right now. Okay? It's not just the tax system why people are pulling jobs out of California to Texas. There's more than that going on, and you ought to look at it very carefully. And I know it's tough stuff, and Eloy can only say so much of it. My father was a superintendent of L.A. schools. I know this very well. <laughs> Folks, you got an issue. So how do you shake that up, Eloy? How do you make some of the changes and cut out some of the bureaucracy and get your um, board of directors more engaged to, to make a move? Well, I don't see Chris moving to Texas and raising his kids there. So, <laughs> but, uh, No, but I'm going to open some schools there. Uh, no, I, and, you know, Chris is right about the rigidity and something that I've fought, fought against. I, I still have great hope in, in, in California. I think we have the right systems in place. We have uh, the economy starting to turn around. The question now becomes, uh, you know, for example, in California we have Proposition 98, which sort of dictates how much money K-12 and community colleges are going to get. The question now for policymakers is, how are you going to invest that money? Are we going to throw good money after bad like we did before, or are we actually going to change policy to allow for the systems to do the kind of innovation that Chris is talking about? And we're not going to do it in a vacuum here. If left alone to their own devices, the state capital is going to do what they've always done because the forces in that capital will continue to pr promote the status quo. So what are you all going to do about that? Are you going to mobilize? Is business going to mobilize and actually make a presence known in that state capital and, and get policymakers to think differently than they thought before? Because in and of itself, it's not going to change unless we, we force it to change. And I think the governor, for, to his credit, has tried to stir some of that change, but even uh, as much as he's been able to, to leverage his background and knowledge, he can't do everything. Well, one of the things that, you know, is frustrating to people in academia and also, you know, in this discussion is that this is not a national headline. It becomes a very esoteric discussion on mobilizing the underclasses to education and the whole, you know, dynamics there that are, you know, have are wrought with, with obstacles. So how do you get this issue, which is you know, the foundation of our economy and our future. I just got a, um, a text today on the California higher ed study, the Latino report, which says unless we graduate more kids from California um, in STEM and other work fields, we're not going to have be able to compete in a global economy. So if this is that alarming an economic imperative, not just a social justice conversation, how do we get this, you know, on the national forum? Felix, you talked about the need for media to engage in this issue. Well, you know, we're very lucky to have a, uh, you know, full disclosure, a media partner with Comcast. Uh, Just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I think it, it comes down to a couple of things. You know, I, I've been listening to the discussion and, you know, we tied it still to academic, you know, and, and all that, but the employers are the end, at the end of the day, the, the end result. And, and you know, I, I had a conversation with Governor Abbott from Texas, uh, and they were talking about their economic development corporation plan and how they're redirecting their FDI investment into that state. 
and how they bring together the community colleges to say, these are the skill sets that we're looking for of the employers that we're bringing in from China, Japan, or whatever it may be, and then so that they're matched ahead of time before the investment goes in. Uh, and the same goes whether it's Comcast opening up a shop in Austin or Texas. It, it, the EDCs of the states are actually a strong indicator of what the skills uh, needs are of those states. And you know, that, that brings me back to, the, to my point, which is I, I think the employers are, are, are a very critical uh, part of this uh, discussion. And, and the community colleges at the end, they are very critical as well. The other thing is, while Starbucks has done this partnership with ASU, if you look at the data, I don't think there's any. Uh, so, you know, so, so how many of these people are actually taking advantage of the Starbucks uh, four-year degree? That would be interesting to see. Uh, and then the other thing is that oftentimes employers uh, have never marketed or recruited out of community colleges directly because they're focused on four-year degrees, right? And so if, if now you're trying to penetrate a market that you've never touched, how do you even go about that? Uh, and the notion of a community college is an entry-level job, but the reality is that they have more life skills than a four-year degree student because the average age of a community college student is 24, 25 or so. Uh, and most of them are veterans as well. Uh, so their skill set is much greater and much higher. Mm -hmm. Raul, do you want to? Yeah, I, I think Felix's point's great, and I think the data is very helpful. We were, we were talking about Apple before, and it, it struck me, right, that I, I can look on, on my music device and say, you know, hit genius, right, and it'll tell me, here are the songs you're going to like, and yet we don't help our students, right, figure that out. Like, there's not the, how do I, you know, we grow up still and think very limited about what our opportunities and options are, and I think what Felix is trying to do is really going to bridge that gap, which I think is very important. As an employer, we want people to fill the jobs, right, up and down kind of the socioeconomic ladder, so there's not a lack of need. Our pace, though, is different, so we need it quickly. I can't go to a hiring manager and say, well, in two years, I'm going to be able to fill this job for you. Um, that doesn't work. I kind of get left out of the room. Um, so they're doing that. Now, I think what we're trying to do is kind of broaden our perspective and think more about a person in totality. So I think Felix's, Felix's demographic of your, your uh, community college student that has more life experiences, maybe a little more mature, becomes more important. I think many employers you know, have been kind of a little bit um, looking at pedigree, right? That four-year school, then even which four-year school, right? You know, even that piece. So that that is changing as there's that widening gap in terms of the ability to hire. Um, but there's a willingness here, and, and I, I echo um, Felix's comments again around. Um, in Philadelphia, we've been starting to build some bridges with some of the schools and community colleges, and it's the first time we've met. You know, and we're the largest, one of the largest employers in the city, and they're very concerned and saying, "Hey, our students aren't graduating, uh, are graduating, but they're not getting jobs. Why aren't they getting jobs?" Or their misconceptions. Well, we know you have so many people who are all applying for those jobs, and I said, "No, actually, we don't. We have very few. There's a huge opportunity there, but they're not coming with the right skills, and that that is the outcome we're looking for. Um, and it's not only again the technical skills. I think." What is getting the, the headlines, which is appropriate, is STEM. Um, but I think it's more than just STEM um, in terms of opportunities across um, the labor force. You've made a, a big point too, Eloy, that you don't think that we should just um, churn out students to be hired at Comcast or other industries, that we have to create you know, holistic you know, um, opportunities for these students to become citizens and, and well-rounded human beings. Um, you're, you're worried about this two-tiered society, but understand the need to, you know, uh, to prepare these kids for skills as well. I, yes. I mean, and, and it's a complicated um, discussion because uh, we have a workforce need, and, and, and I agree with all that. Um, at the same time, uh, we are not, uh, you know, employers just can't push off their technical training onto community colleges. I mean, our job is to educate students to be prepared to navigate life and to be good citizens and to be part of society and to have the skills necessary to navigate you know, their future. So we can't just all of a sudden narrow it all down to just the basics that, and I'm not, not only because Comcast is here, I'm picking up Comcast, but yeah. just to what Comcast needs today, in this quarter or next quarter, we have to build students. And, and part of the disconnect, I think, is there's an immediate need that employers face and there's a whole pipeline of students that are coming through the system that takes much longer to adjust. And so we've got to keep pushing ourselves to, to find that nexus earlier in the education process so that when students come out, A, they don't carry a bunch of excess units that they never needed just because our community colleges can't schedule uh, around the students' need, but at the same time that they come out with the necessary skills to be able to navigate all the different things that they'll need to 
to, to be able to do once they get beyond that entry level job. Because uh, we want them to continue to push forward and to build families that have livable wages and to create generations of, of college and career ready uh, students. Is it about just increasing funding or is it, as you say, Chris, we need to shift the culture and the vision and the curriculums of these schools? It's, it's about increasing smart funding. This is not something that's cheap. Changing lives, I mean, you can, you, there is no system of eyeballs and clicks. Eyeballs and clicks and content on the web is not what fundamentally changes these lives. A meaningful relationship with another adult who cares about you and might give you just a tad a bit of unconditional love, which is what changes these lives. And so you have to think about the scalability of that and how technology does that. And there's a way to do that. And when you do it, the rate of return on society is astronomical and we ought to do a whole lot more of it. Um, and so funding, and that's why the free community colleges, I think Felix and I are both pushing back, if you just make the same system cheaper and free and more funding, it's not going to work. You've got to change that. And a lot of this involves the human dynamic of taking a cultural group, and your issue in California is severe on this, but frankly, it will be really complimentary of you, some of the stuff you're doing is super smart. You actually do have the best system of articulation up through the system. The problem is you're still losing kids in ninth grade. You're losing them at twelfth grade. You're losing them in the community college to the next level. So you got to double click around that and that's not cheap. One idea I'll throw out there which I think you should all pay attention to is this debate about AP versus concurrent enrollment of college classes in high school. Because speed to completion is the biggest issue for low income families. So the quicker they can get that certificate, right. the quicker they can get the bachelor's degree. And by the way, it's cheaper. It costs an average of $50,000 to create a certificate or a degree out of the average community college in America because that's because the completion rates are 20 percent. So there's a lot of value in figuring this out. So my issue is there's some smart policy you guys are doing. Lastly, the other issue here is you've got to deal with the non-documented students. Thank you, California, for being a leader on this. Do not backtrack on this. This is a hidden pool of talent, this country. We see it all the time in American Honors because we, we obviously do work in community colleges. So you have to deal with the demographic issues of the Latino community. You need to the system has to reorient itself to make sure that that community gets through those bridges. They have to get through the ninth grade to the college to the high school bridge. We've got to get the bridge from high school to community college, from community college to completion. And you cannot let that be an eight year experience because the probability that somebody gets sick or something happens goes up dramatically and you end up with a 20% completion rate and a $50,000 state funded degree. It's kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the room because people do not like to talk about this as a Latino-centric issue because it fires up conversations about immigration reform and the need for equity. Um, how do we address this issue um, with real realism and uplift this community and target this community to be uplifted so that we can pipeline them through? Elo, that, you're a good one to start that discussion. Well. Uh, first of all, you know, the moral argument uh, has failed for years, so I'm done with the moral argument. But we're at a point now in California where you have no choice. Uh, it is an economic argument. If we don't do a better job in our schools, we are not going to have a workforce that will sustain the economy and we will all sink. And what happens in California will happen to the rest of the nation. So you can cut it up however you want. The reality is Latinos are the fastest growing population uh, in California and throughout the country. They are the workforce of tomorrow and we have to deal with those realities. Just in Long Beach alone, which 15 years ago was predominantly white, uh, our K-12 is over 50 percent Latino. My community college is majority minority. Um, so that is who we have in our schools. And so California has to take the lead and show the way forward because What's happening here is what the rest of the country is going to see in the near future. And Felix, you brought up a good point the other day. You know, we haven't even looked at studies of how our GDP would be impacted if we empowered this community. Yeah, you know, I started thinking about my mom and dad and, you know, how, how, how and their grandmother and my grandmother and how they'll retain their Social Security check. Uh, and if our generation and Eloy's student population is not employed, uh, we'll have an economic crisis uh, bigger than what we had in 2008. And so it's, it's the reality. It's, uh, it's an impact not just in California, but also within the United States and potentially can impact the world. Um, so unless we get these people employed, uh, prepared for the workforce, you know, we'll, we're going to have major problems. 
But you have gone so far to say not only um, educated, employed, but become millionaires and billionaires because that's how we reinvest in our communities. So talk about the need for entrepreneurism. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have a couple of young entrepreneurs here in the audience as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, I believe, <coughs> excuse me, there, there's a big need to enable these young entrepreneurs to have access to capital. Uh, even the ones that end up in tier one schools may have come from poverty stricken backgrounds and do not have that network and access to capital. Uh, and unfortunately, the way Silicon Valley works is that it's on an algorithm. If you hit certain standards, and most of the kids that are getting funding are already coming from people that have money already uh, and need it the least, uh, the reality is the people that need it the most and have probably more innovative ideas are not receiving it. So when you look at the data, the 1% of VC-backed companies are African American. Less than that, about 0.5 of a percent are Hispanic. Uh, that's pretty sad. Uh, and if you look at the, how we're going to sustain philanthropy uh, moving forward, uh, how do we do that if we can't even get our own people to reinvest in society? Uh, the older generation in these communities are not investing in the younger tech entrepreneurs because they don't understand uh, technology, uh, you know, first-time wealth. So they, they tend to be very uh, you know, hesitant of taking risk, and oftentimes they made their assets in uh, you know, media, real estate, and things like that, so they have no understanding of, of anything that we talk about. To them, you know, we, we sound like nerdy people. Uh, so you know, that's, those are real issues, uh, and so the only way to change that is by also involving you know, interesting policies, as Chris has said. And, and I think, in my opinion, it's creating uh, incubator funds that fund entrepreneurs within community colleges. Uh, I know that Eloy has a 10,000 small business initiative, but that's focused already on individuals that have a business. Uh, what are we doing about the individuals that want to create a business? Uh, and that's the biggest impediment to growth. There's no different than a kid who grows up in a Brooklyn project who has a great idea and is a great coder versus a kid that ends up going to Stanford because he's connected and has a well-off background and then gets money from Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, in my opinion, I would bet on the kid in the project because they're more hungry. Uh, and so, you know, those are the issues that we have today. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me put it differently and then you have to change the frame. Like everybody talks about immigration is a problem. My goodness, it's a gift. Like right now as a venture capitalist, if you had to just invest in demographics and opportunity, would you invest in France's immigration system and its future or would you invest in California? You would short France and you would completely double down in California. Like demographics, unfortunately, right. is your future. Like look at the numbers. These, these, these European economies that don't have enough employees to sustain themselves, the Russian economy, and what are they doing? What is their immigrant, immig immigration issues? Their immigration issues are much more tougher than we have. This is a gift, this society, and we need to start looking at it as a gift and an opportunity, and we need to be like venture capitalists and double down because the rate of return on this for our society, for our children and grandchildren, is going to be astronomical. So stop talking about it as a problem and look at the gift that's right in front of us. Well, this is an image problem, and that's why I brought up media earlier, and this is why you're tired of the social justice narrative and making it an economic mm -hmm. imperative. When you do the math, one out of every two kids under 18 in California is Latino. 49% of the girls, 10 to 14, are Latina. So if this is our workforce and we're only graduating 12% and fewer in STEM, what does that future look like for the overall economy? In fact, California narratives have suggested that we will not be able to compete if this trajectory continues. So what do we do to change the narrative and get all this um, realism and these facts out to change the perception of who these people are and that there's great potential in this community to invest in? Uh, you got to reframe. Sure. It is a gift. You have to talk yeah. about it as the wonderful gift that we've been given. Let's make sure and take this and go the next thing. And make sure that people of my generation understand your Social Security check is now dependent upon basically executing this gift. Yeah, but all you have to do is look at the immigration reform narrative, which no one wants to get yeah. into because it's incendiary, but there you find out that we are perceived as leeches, we're perceived as siphons off this economy and not contributors, which, by the way, the facts will sustain. So how do you change the, the imaging, the branding? I think the reframing is a, there's a time horizon that we're not good at, and I think our society is becoming more short-term, right? We, we, we tax you know, Vine at six seconds, you know, feels long now, right? You know, I mean, we struggle with how do we take a, a message and consolidate it. And, 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 I, and I hear a lot of the conversation, you know, company, everyone needs to look at it more as an investment versus an expense. And we tend to look at the payroll line as an expense, not as an investment. It has a knock-on 
to everything we're discussing. And we really have to change that narrative or frame, I think, as you're saying, which I like, and take a long-term view. The problem is that's not our attention span. Our attention span is getting shorter. So to think about, you know, someone's Social Security check is, well, that's their problem. And that it, it, the reality is, no, it'll be our problem one day, but that's not what we're stopping to think about. Um, and we've got to get the data. The data shows Europe is kind of on the front edge of the problem and is going to have to change. And, and we, we are lucky. Um, so. Please, we have a question from the audience. Uh, thanks. In some ways, so I said, I think the observation about the framing problem is profound. In some ways, you could argue that even what we call the education system and the way we refer to that is a framing problem because it implies that education is not something that happens uh, throughout our lives. And you know, you pointed out that education, we need to create a culture of lifelong learning. So with that aside, um, what what else, Chris or anyone else on the panel, do you see as a framing problem in education, and how would you propose an alternative that could really shift the conversation in a dramatic way? Um, that's well, while a Chris great. is thinking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why he got the fifty million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are many framing problems in, in public education. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, we need to contend with the fact that uh, yes. Public education has needed disruption, and disruption is happening with or without. Um, I mean, people like Felix are disrupting the way we, we, we look at uh, how we treat our students. But, um, but we can't abandon this notion of public education because it is what got us here, and we can't. We have to invest both time, energy in it to make it happen uh, the way it needs to happen. Um, the, the other frame is we keep assuming that there's something wrong with all these kids coming through the system and instead of taking a step back and trying to figure out what's wrong with the system because I guarantee you those of us who attended the, our universities would have a hard time getting into those universities today you know I, I have the privilege of serving as a region and I just looked at Berkeley's um, average GPA to get in the freshman admin 4.5 how many of you had a 4.5 when you were coming through high school? So, so it isn't that you know this next generation is just a bunch of stupid kids. It's the competition has just gone insane to get in, and we haven't kept up with the need for capacity. We haven't changed our systems to allow for different kinds of learning. So we, we need to reframe what this population is. It's not those kids. It's it's what have we done to change? Uh, and and we, we've got to adapt how we treat them and give them the opportunities they need. You know, my 11-year-old, my 12-year-old uh, now, uh, she can get access to a lot more information than I had at 12. So in some ways, she's a hell of a lot better off than I was. But how are we adjusting our, our systems to allow them to express all this new knowledge? So, yeah, I, I, I was just saying, I think we talk about it as a system, but what we've all said is it's not really a system in terms of a total system. It's disparate, right? So I, I think that, to me, continues to be a takeaway of, you know, successful companies, if they're launching a product, don't do it in isolation, right? They, they kind of know who the end user is before they're building it, Felix, and they work through that at all points, and they've got touch points. And if you think about agile technology approaches now, it's to address the fact that things are changing and you can't come up with a blueprint, walk away, and then revisit it two years later when you're done because things have changed and you need to make real Real time, and and that's the system that all of us need to figure out. How do we build that common framework to build that? I, I, and I think that's that's critical. We're not doing that today. We we each have our own little kind of silos or, or fiefdoms. So I think this works, and this is the similar big frame issue. You gave right. me a lot of time. I know. <laughs> I, I hope, I hopefully, this lives up to the uh, the, the pregnant pause. Um, the Carnegie Mellon unit is probably dead. And so Carnegie Mellon unit was a unit defined to basically allocate the time of professors well over 150 years ago, whatever it is. And so a lot of the competency base, and so it's a hybrid because you can't go back to have a two-tier caste system of Votex certificates and then everybody else gets a bachelor's degree. You need to look at the bachelor's degree and what does it mean and what is the assessed and what is the learning involved in that bachelor's degree. But you also need to argue, and I'll ask this question, if you don't believe in competency-based learning, you probably shouldn't get on an airplane this afternoon, right? If you don't believe in, in competency-based right. learning, right. that you don't need a BA or a bachelor's or a master's degree in flying, you shouldn't get on a plane because guess what? There is no PhD in 747s. Right. It's a competency-based learning system by the FAA. So there's a hybrid system, and whether a doctor is really a competency-based learning process 
or whether it's a Carnegie Mellon process. You need to think very carefully on this. And I think this is a little bit where Eloy, Felix, and other people are going is you can't immediately get rid of the Carnegie May system of, of units. But basically, all of Title IV and all the federal government and all of us fund the Carnegie Mellon unit. You need to create a hybrid system of competency-based certificates that still build to a bachelor's degree that gives us the citizens that we need. I hope that helped. That's a frame. We had a question back here. So I've got a, uh, a company in Los Angeles. We have about 500 employees, and we always have a tough time finding entry-level employees because college grads, they want to make a gajillion dollars a year and run the company day one. Uh, and we have a tough time <laughs> know meeting well. that, uh, that skill set. Uh, but I also started a nonprofit that helps inner city high school kids learn about business, careers, and entrepreneurship. And we're in about 20 schools right now, and, and primarily uh, African American and Latino schools, East LA, Inglewood, Compton, you name it. And one of the challenges we've seen, and talked to a lot of principals and students, is um, the students that, that succeed and, and sort of you know, get great jobs and go to college, there, there's almost a universal commonality as they leave their neighborhoods and they don't come back. And so I think that a lot of things we've talked about here, fixing the educational system, uh, the college system, the infrastructure, they're all great and they all need to be improved. But I think also there's a big correlation between parental and community involvement and basically people excelling in high school. So how do we help change that conversation? Because if a lot of the successful students leave and they move to Brentwood or Silicon Valley and they don't open up businesses in their community. And their communities are basically all the, the you know, successful, talented, young people that make it end up leaving. You know, it's a complete drain on those communities and how do we then set the appropriate level of expectation? There's local businesses they can go work for, there's people they can look up to. Hey, that kid went to my high school, he made it, I can make it too. So how do we change that conversation and I don't know if, if government can get involved. Maybe they can with tax incentives or credits or, or whatnot. But it's just, it doesn't seem to be happening right now. Well, I, I think you're, you're right on. Um, the, the challenge is how do you change the dynamic? I mean, no matter how you cut it up, you know, education and wealth go together. Um, uh, you know, those neighborhoods that uh, are not producing uh, wealth, in the families that live in those neighborhoods, I mean, you can directly tie education attainment to to those outcomes. So, so how do you change that dynamic? Um, because far too few of those kids are actually coming out and succeeding. There are those that we point to, but you know, we need to quit celebrating the three that go to Harvard and celebrate the you know the thousand that go to Cal State, yep. um, because that's how you begin to build communities. Um, uh, so we need to do a better job there. I mean, it, it's sort of like, um, you know, India or China, you know, those economies that were around 20 years ago, we were picking off uh, degreed uh, adults uh, easily. Now they stay put. Why? Because they've built an economy there that allows for um, individuals to actually flourish. So we've got to do those in, in our communities. And we all know what those census tracts are. We all know what those zip codes are. Uh, but, you know, uh, we, we keep coming back to the same dilemma. You look in those communities, there's no wealth, there's no investment. Uh, so somehow or another, and, and I agree with Chris, you can't just redistribute the wealth. You actually have to create jobs in those communities and give people a reason to stay put. Well, uh, that's our, our time for, for today. Um, Felix, why don't you wrap it up? The three things we most need to take away here today are employer and college partnerships increased, and what else? Uh, yeah, I mean, it goes back to what we said before. It's formulating that employment triangle <clears throat> where we tie in education, skills, and work. And at the end, they reinvest into communities uh, uh, that may be underserved and underinvested. Uh, that's what I take away from this today. And understand it's not a social justice conversation. It's an absolute American imperative, and it also speaks to the identity of this country and the promise of access to all to the dream. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Nice job.